Welcome to Nursing School Explain in this video on kidney stones or the medical term nephrolithiasis, meaning nephro pertaining to the kidney and litho is a stone. So for risk factors, Caucasians are at a higher risk in patients with a family history, as well as in the summer months, people are more prone to getting kidney stones and that is because we tend to get more dehydrated because we sweat and uh, might not take in enough fluid. And that is a very big risk factor for developing kidney stones. And also people living in industrialized countries because their diet usually is high in sodium and high in protein, which makes, which contributes also to the dehydration aspect of things. Now, pathophysiologically, when we get dehydrated, crystals kind of form and they clump together and then forms different types of stones. 80% of kidney stones are made of calcium oxalate and 20% of other kidney stones, uh, of other materials. If we look at the diagram here, we have the kidneys, the ureters and the bladder and then the urethra. So the three most common locations for kidney stones are at the UPJ, meaning the ureteral pelvic junction, where the ureter and the pelvis of the kidney meet, because that's where it kind of gets narrow and that, that these crystals are um, not able to be eliminated. Or stones also form at the lower third of the ureter before it enters the bladder, or at the ureteral vesicle junction, meaning where the ureter and the vesicle, the bladder meet right before it would enter the bladder itself. So these three are the most common locations. So then signs and symptoms will be severe colicky, flank or lower abdominal, sometimes even genital pain, depending on where it's located. So if it's at the UPJ in the kidney, it'll be more likely to be flank pain. If it's in the lower third of the ureter or at the ureteral vesicle junction, it might be in the lower abdomen, depending on what side and radiating to the groin or to the genitals. The patient will also have urgency and frequency. And then many times anything that has to do with the kidney usually causes nausea and vomiting. They might also have blood in the urine, hematuria, whether that's visible with the naked eye, meaning gross hematuria or microscopic that we can only detect on the urinalysis. And they will have some CVA tenderness, which is costal vertebral angle, which is the costal where the rib meets the vertebra of the back. So in that very back space there, if we just lightly tap the patient, it will be very painful because that kidney is irritated underneath um, that the rib cage there and a little bit of pounding will cause some severe pain so we want to be very careful there and i've had patients who've had female patients who've had been through childbirth and also had kidney stones and they say kidney stones are very similar in terms of the severity of the pain as childbirth is so just keep that in mind for diagnostic tests, we want to check a urinalysis, so check for all those things, proteinuria, hematuria, and maybe any kinds of signs of infection. We also want to check a CBC and the CMP to evaluate their white count to see if there's, again, an underlying infection. Check their electrolytes because we want to make sure that there's nothing going on with their potassium that we always have to keep in the back of our mind with any kind of renal problems. And then certainly we want to keep an eye on their renal function with checking the BUN and creatinine. As for imaging studies, we can take a KUB, which is a plain x-ray of the kidneys, ureter, and bladder, but sometimes it doesn't show small kidney stones or any obstructions. So a CT scan can be more helpful with that. Also, it will show any complications when there is now a blockage or an obstruction causing hydronephrosis, and we'll get into that in a moment. Or we can check an ultrasound and that is mostly reserved for either children or pregnant women who we don't want to expose to the radiation. Treatment. If the stone is less than five milliliters, it is likely to pass spontaneously. So we just have to get the patient through the episode of the pain and the nausea and the vomiting. So we're going to manage them with opioids and NSAIDs with antiemetics and then medications in the group of alpha adrenergic blockers. 
Um, they end in OSIN and the very commonly used one here is Flowmax, meaning it maximizes the flow of the urine by relaxing the ureter, meaning that the ureter now gets dilated and it makes the stone easier to pass. And Flowmax, the generic name is Tamsulosin. So the OSINs here are these alpha adrenergic blockers and I have a separate video about those, the class of medications. And then certainly we also want to give the patient fluid, whether they're able to take it by mouth or in the IV, because we pre want to prevent this dehydration that we've talked at many um, uh, places here. We also want to get rid of any hematuria, so kind of dilute that blood that we might see in the urine and then help flush any small stones out. Now, if the stone is greater than five millimeters or it is not passing, or there it causes an obstruction, meaning now it's completely blocking the kidney or the ureter and the, the urine is basically stuck and prevented from flowing downward into the bladder or the ureter, then the patient might need to have some surgery. And that can either be a ureteroscopy where they go in with a scope through the urethra, through the bladder, find that stone in the ureter wherever it is sitting and fish it out and remove it. There can be a percutaneous nephrolithotomy, so meaning going through the skin ref um, and removing that kidney stone. So that would mean that they actually put an instrument in through the skin on the side of the flank and go into the kidney and manually remove that stone. Or there can be this treatment called extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, meaning outside of the body, and then there is shock waves that are used close to the patient's flank and kidney area and these shock waves break down the stones into small fragments so the patient can then pass them. Sometimes the patient will require a stent which is a special tube that goes all the way from the kidney down into the bladder and even through the urethra and then the patient will have a little string hanging out from the urethral opening and that just helps to keep the urinary tract open and allowing that stone or the stone fragments to pass. Now complications, hydronephrosis, meaning water kidney. So now if we have an obstruction somewhere here and the urine comes from the kidney but is not able to go past here, then that kidney can get swollen and that refers to that hydronephrosis. And hydronephrosis is a very serious complication because now the, the kidney is swelling and it's not able to perform its function and the patient can go into renal failure because of that. Now they still have another kidney hopefully but um, it can be very very severe. Now they can also go into urosepsis meaning that now that kidney stone is getting infected and um, or because of this hydronephrosis they're turning septic causing a, a bloodstream infection and that can certainly be very serious. They can also get pyelonephritis, meaning a kidney infection if that stone gets stuck there and causes some problems. And then they can have renal damage if that sto stone is causing some shearing and some scar formation, especially if the patient has repeated episodes of these kidney stones. Now for our nursing care, of course, we always want to assess first. So very important to stay on top of the vital signs for pain management, dehydration management. Check the patient for pain, nausea, vomiting, and manage them with medications appropriately. Certainly with the vital signs, we always want to encourage fluids and or give them IV fluids if they've been admitted. We want to check the urinalysis and maybe even the culture in case we are suspecting an infection or a hydronephrosis. We want to check their labs to stay on top of their white count as well as their kidney function. Check their eyes and nose to make sure that the kidney is actually filtering not only the intake and the output, but also the color of the urine that we might be witnessing having some blood or maybe even some um, sediment or stones looking in there. And then we want to strain the urine. So there are special devices that are basically, it looks like a small strainer that you would use in the kitchen that the patient urinates through and then any stone or fragments that come through would be able to be strained out. And then that stone can be sent to the lab for analysis to see what it contains so that the patient then can make dietary adjustments to prevent these kidney stones from happening in the future. For patient teaching, we want to teach them to always strain the urine because we don't know when that stone is going to come through until they catch something. 
and then to prevent dehydration because like I said earlier summer months and dehydration cause a lot of these microcrystals and then the stones to form. If we know what the stone contains or what material it is made of, like I said before, calcium oxalate is the, the majority of stones. We want to also make sure that we encourage a low oxalate diet and things that contain a lot of calcium oxalate is coffee, tea, chocolate, unfortunately, as well as nuts. So we want to make sure we teach our patient about that. We also want to encourage a low sodium diet that goes along with preventing dehydration and then increase intake in citrate, which helps to sometimes dissolve any of those microcrystals that might form. And citrate is citrus, so lemon, lemonade, oranges, uh, those kind of foods. So thank you for watching this video on kidney stones or nephrolithiasis. Also check out the other videos in my renal disorders playlist. And I'll see you soon right here on Nursing School Explained. Thanks for watching.